Not only is this movie bad, but it's also pretty culturally insensitive. We hit rock bottom in this franchise as we discuss Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. 16th century Japan. Brave men ride into battle. Fighting an evil emperor. With their only hope. A golden scepter that can open the gates of time itself. Now, in their darkest hour, come four brave fighters from another time. Another place. Another species? You were expecting maybe uh, the Adams family? They're back. And they're back in time. Hey, Adams, check it out! We're in Shogun! Once before, demons defeated my ancestors. Now they've come back for me. Talk about your quantum leap! My cannons can destroy these monsters, my lord. This is the Superhero Pantheon. On this podcast, we take one superhero film a week and decide whether it should be in the Pantheon, the Pile of Shame, or somewhere in between. My name is Jerome Cusan. You can find me on Twitter at Jerome C1985. You can find additional episodes of this podcast through Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and all of your favorite podcast apps through the real world. We strongly encourage you to leave a four or five star review so as to help people discover this show and the great work that the folks at the real world are doing. If you would like to interact with us or send feedback, you could do so in two ways. First, send an email to superheropantheon at gmail.com. Second, find us on Twitter at Hero Pantheon. My co host for this week and every week will be Brian DeBrain. He can be found on Twitter at Brian DeBrain. And Brian, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 is a bad movie. I was eight years old when I saw this in theaters, Brian. I made my parents take me to this movie. I distinctly remember take it, making them go, and I, I have retroactively apologized for making them, do, making them do this because even when I was eight years old... Eight-year-old Jerome knew this was not a good movie. Yeah, I uh, I took my dad to this movie. I asked him to take me to it. This is the first Ninja Turtles movie I saw in theater, so I, I remember this clearly. I saw it at the Fallbrook Theater near my house before it became an outdoor mall kind of thing going on, when it was an indoor mall. It, it That mall looked like something out of Stranger Things Season 3, I swear to God. And I remember, I even remember getting Burger King afterward in the food court after watching the movie. So there you go. But uh, I also remember missing the first five minutes because we were kind of late. Because I didn't walk, I walked in and she was already in Japan. <laughs> so I kind of missed a uh, little bit. And then I watched it again on VHS a year later when it rented it and filled all the gaps. But yeah, it's it's pretty goddamn terrible. Um, logic is out the window and they're, they don't even tell you what part or what uh, year in the past they go to. I think they, they basically say it's feudal Japan. I thought they did say the year. I thought it was like 1609 or something like that. All I heard was feudal Japan, and that was just like, well, okay, they're very specific on that end. The exact year, just feudal Japan. So at the time this movie was released, Golden Harvest thought the franchise had reached the end of its movie career, and thanks to this movie, it certainly did. The project went forward with low expectations, little fanfare, and a modest $17 million budget, and let me tell you, it is so obvious that this movie was made on the cheap, because in this case, Jim Henson's Creature Shop did not do the costumes. Instead, there was a company called All Effects that took over for the animatronic turtles and Splinter, and they looked really bad. God, Splinter was terrible, man. It looks like a completely different rat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I don't know why they changed his hair to white hairs when it should be just normal straight brown hair. And then they changed his look, and the turtles look skinnier, and they added spots to the turtles for some reason. It, it was weird. And then, because of the, the change in the costumes or whatever, again, like I mentioned last week, I noticed, like, the little creases in the costume and little flabby areas where, like, the they bent the arm area too much or the, the shoulder. So, yeah, kind of cheap on the suits, and I, it really, really showed. And it's like they spent all this other money on the costumes for the rest of the cast and the background actors, but they just couldn't get the suits right for this movie, which sucks. 
Corey Feldman did come back to play Donatello. That is the one thing that I would say is an improvement from the third one compared to the second one. He was paid $1,500. That's right, $1,500. For the first one, he asked for a raise for this one, and he was told because of he went to rehab that he would, again, only be paid $1,500. I guess he needed the money because he did the role. I mean, this is just a crappy way to treat the actors, and, I mean, I think it's garbage that, that, this, that this could happen, and it's, it's really unfortunate because... These movies were very, very successful, and Corey Feldman, who at the time was a really big star, probably should have been able to cash in on this. It's weird, too, because he's not even top billing. Like, out of all the actors in this movie specifically, he probably should have got top billing because he's probably the biggest star in all of them, and yet Elias Cote, who had two roles in this movie, gets top billing just because he decided to come back and put on a wig to play Casey Jones. This is a very strange... He has very strange hair. April also has strange hair. There may be a burning question about that. But there were plans for a fourth and fifth Turtles movie. I don't want to get into those plans because they do not sound very good. And we can get right into the heroes. I don't even know what to say about the Turtles at this point. They are listless because there's no shredder. We see them dancing in the first scene and Raphael throws his weapon and destroys the radio that's playing the music and that is really never commented upon until we get to the end when two of the turtles michelangelo and Raphael, tease possibly staying in feudal japan and not coming and it is just so bizarre the way that the turtles behave there's a lot of one-liners again the the humor is very similar to the second one but we don't really get any character work involving any of the turtles I guess they try to soften Raphael up by having him develop a relationship uh, with a young woman in feudal Japan, but this this is not Logan, so it's not going to work. Yeah, and Michelangelo got more of like a solo kind of treatment. He's the one who got separated from the group this time, um, but that's the only interesting change they made, you know what I mean? Like, it's usually Raphael getting into trouble. This time it was Michelangelo, but uh, yeah, it's just... You know, they're trying to just make jokes and trying to fill time. You know what I mean? Let's get the turtles in some trouble. We'll save them. You know what I mean? And uh, they just have more of that turtle humor uh, where he's ducking and hiding in the shell. And they've done that before in the other two movies, but they just kind of rehash some of those jokes. They're kind of running out. And then, you know, it, it sucks because, like, they could have had more chemistry and more, you know, character development and maybe focus more on Michelangelo and maybe mature him a little bit because that seems like where they were trying to go, but then they didn't because um, he, you know, makes that immature decision at the end to want to stay even though he's forced to go back. But just little things like that and the, the voice change again and, and Raphael just kind of just takes it away from that great performance from the first movie. So I hate to see that kind of like downgrade, but it happened. Yeah, it's really, really unfortunate, and April is involved in the action a little bit more, but she just gives, I think, this very grating performance that does not work at all, and I'm trying to, I was trying to put my finger on what specifically just bothered me, and I think the way that they handle the time travel is just so bad that they don't really explain the rules for time travel, because the turtles are seen in the, in, in the scrolls in feudal Japan, but they really haven't done anything yet, and it's really never explained, it's really never addressed. April is able to travel back in time. Her clothing changes, but for some reason the Walkman travels with her, and she just is the damsel in distress, and she really doesn't get to do a whole lot. And the other thing, too, is like, do they switch underwear? Is like that dude wearing her panties now? There's like a lot of weird questions that come up with this time travel gimmick that they came up with, where it's like it's one person's holding this light or lantern, right, or the scepter, and I guess the same scepter, if it's being held at a different place in time, can activate and switch the person, right? And then they'll switch clothes, but only certain things. It's weird. Like they didn't spe specify any of these rules, but um, and it just kind of hurt the movie as a whole. And I know we're talking about the heroes, but you know, it kind of applies too. Cause they brought back Casey Jones for almost no reason at all. And, and it was just a waste that he didn't fight anybody. You know what I mean? And we didn't get that badass Casey Jones from the first one. So 
Yeah, I mean, he's basically there to just babysit uh, the people who travel from feudal to Japan to New York, and basically they play into every racist Japanese stereotype with the accents and with not understanding things. I mean, it is retrograde Asian racism, if I've ever seen it. Yeah, and uh, the stuff with the hockey stuff, that was that was weird too, and just like being fascinated with the TV and everything. It's just weird that the way they did everything and the way they put everything together. And I still don't know why they had Casey Jones play two roles. It makes no sense to me. But I just I guess they wanted to like make people confused and like is this his ancestor? Well, I think they were trying to go for something like a parallel because April would be sympathetic to this person because he looks like Casey Jones and they're dating or formally dating. I think that's the reason that they had they cast him in that role is so that you would immediately either sympathize or you would connect with this character because he is Casey Jones in this other timeline. I don't think it is meant to be some sort of an ancestor. I literally think it just has to do with the fact that he looks like Casey Jones, and that does not in any way excuse the way that the character is treated or the way that he, the, that he is wasted. I mean, I just think it speaks to how poorly April is treated because she is literally just hanging out with a guy because he looks like or either her boyfriend or her ex-boyfriend. There was an entire episode of Friends that dealt with this very same issue, and I think they did a better job. Yeah, it's it's messed up and not that good. So overall, I'm going to give it a five, and that also includes the fact that Splinter just has nothing to do in this movie. He's just sitting on a chair the whole time in this movie, and it just feels like they wasted him. You know what I mean? And he was supposed to he was giving out advice to the to the prince that switched bodies with April, but still, it just felt like a waste of time. Just him sitting there and then doing an Elvis joke at the end of the movie. I'm giving this a three. I think a five is uh, is pretty generous, given the lack of character development across just about this entire universe, so to speak. And yeah, I was just highly unimpressed by everything that went on on the hero side of things. Let's talk about the villains. They are completely forgettable. And I think that you wanted to specifically talk about Stuart Wilson, who plays Walker. At one point in the movie, one of the turtles refers to Walker as the Zorro dude. What makes this significant? Well, he ends up being the villain in The Mask of Zorro five years later. And we'll, we're going to review that movie because it's kind of significant also in Batman's history where, you know, the movie they were watching that night was The Mask of Zorro. So, yeah, it's just kind of odd that they laid that line there and he ends up being... Uh, you know, the villain also riding a horse half the movie in that movie as well. So weird things like that, man, just weird things. Also, he plays a Spaniard in that movie. So again, kind of like whitewashing the role, but whatever. He was also in Hot Fuzz, which is one of the greatest movies of all time. A movie we will not be reviewing, but it's pretty amazing. And, uh, he is really the only notable person. Oh, there was one more notable, notable person that was in this movie. The actor who plays Niles. Brian, I don't know if you've ever seen this actor. His name is John Aylward, but he has been in some of the best dramas, the best television dramas of all time. I'm talking about your Shameless, your ERs, American Horror Stories, Fringe, all of these these legendary TV shows, Mad Men, um, and there's one more, and The West Wing. And here he's literally getting wet willies for the entire movie. Yeah, he's got one of those faces. Like, I noticed his face, and I was like, this guy's been in a lot of things. I just couldn't pinpoint it, but you're right. He's been in all these other things. And to me, he's always going to be the wet willy guy, and that sucks, but, you know. And that doesn't, it's it's weird because he just gets a wet willy and runs away. Like, it's, he's not even getting his ass kicked. But I guess they're afraid of these turtles and from the past because they think they're demons. And there's, we'll get into the whole ancestral thing with the turtles, too, because apparently they have ancestors that were Ninja Turtles as well. Uh, I will say the person that I almost feel the most sorry for is Sab Shimono, who plays uh, Lord Nor- Norniga, Nornaga, and he is kind of in this hapless role, and again, kind of what happens to him, him getting a haircut in the end, and literally having a bell, bell or something fall on top of him. It's really, it's really bad, and his career wouldn't get any better because he would also end up in Waterworld, too. Yeah, and they could have done so much with this because I feel like the direct, the writer and director watched maybe some like kung fu 
fantasy films and wanted to try to recreate that with the turtles, but just didn't know how to put that world together and just like went out of the woods, filmed some stuff, gave some costumes out, but couldn't really do the world building and make you buy into that world. You know what I mean? It's just like, it just felt like a bunch of sets and some random stuff in the woods. So it's just weird that how they put that all together. You know what I mean? The, the writer and director. And then when you put the villains together with it, it's just like, it doesn't feel the way, you know, you intended it, I think. I felt like they intended this to be more of like a fantasy kind of kung fu movie, and they just didn't execute it because they don't know how to make that kind of movie. Because this reminded me of like early Stephen Chow. Stephen Chow made like Kung Fu Hustle. You know what I mean? Like early, his early work is very much this fantasy style of like uh, olden times, kung fu, martial arts, that kind of thing, um, and they try to do that here, and it just doesn't work, and you can t clearly tell that with the villain, so my villain score is a three, as much as I like the dude um, from <laughs> The Mask of Zorro, and he's probably the best part of this movie, and he's taking it seriously, he's probably acting like a completely different movie, it feels like, because he's so serious, but everything else is just falling apart, and the henchmen are just terrible, like, even worse than the foot, I think. Yeah, the fact that he's actually trying is just bizarre, given the movie that he is in. I'm going even lower. I'm giving this a two because they were just totally, totally forgettable. And that is also my score for the story as things are basically chaotic with the turtles going back in time and being replaced by uh, the Japanese warriors, the soldiers. And there really isn't a whole lot to this story as the turtles... I feel like any time we see these kinds of stories, even with Wolverine, it's basically they go to Asia or they go to Japan to quote-unquote find themselves. This is a very common trope in fiction, and it is, it is not something that I really think should be done, especially in 2019, but it's something that we've seen in other movies as well. The Wolverine kind of did this to an extent, but basically saving a village from the quote-unquote empire at least in this case, they were white instead of being Asian. I don't know if that makes it any better or worse. But for me, this story is pretty forgettable and pretty bad. And none of the action sequences are particularly memorable. The Turtles don't really have a lot of memorable lines. There really isn't a lot of character development. And for all those reasons, that's why I'm giving this a 2. Um, I'll give it a 3. I'll be a little more generous, but I just feel like the thing... Okay, so basically in the movie, in the past, they referenced these four demons that came beforehand and took down the emperor or the whatever, the clan or whatever, right? And this was ages ago. And supposedly, I guess that's supposed to be the ancestors of the turtles, even though these are the first iteration of the turtles? Do you see what I'm saying? Like, none of that made sense at all. Like, why even reference ancient Ninja Turtles when these are the first Ninja Turtles? It makes no, like, logical sense in, like, a time frame or a timeline, anything like that. It's just so fucking weird. And the fact that, like, they couldn't establish the, the, their own rules for the time travel itself and whether or not they actually gave the date of where they went or whatever, it just felt like that they they wanted this time travel thing and they couldn't even figure out their own rules. You know what I mean? And that's so crucial. Every time you do, you do a time travel movie, you have to figure out the rules to make it work. Otherwise, it's just going to fall apart and there's going to be so many logic holes and plot holes that you end up with this kind of story. Um, and then the ending is very similar to Shredder. You know, like, the bad guy's at the top of the, the building, he's about to do something bad, gets caught off guard, and then falls. And that's exactly what happens to the dude. And then the the bad guy, you know, the Lord Orinaga or whatever, he turns good at the end when the sun comes back and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's just poorly put together, man. And it's just really... At least it's not as worse as the third act and number two. I would say this is slightly better on this third act, but uh, that's not saying much at all. And the comedy is just not there. And they try to do all this stuff with, like, the comedy in the torture chamber or whatever, and that doesn't hit, so... Um, the only thing I give credit for is, like, the costumes, but we'll talk about in the technical score, but... The story for me is a three just because it's poorly put together, and the time travel stuff just doesn't work. Right, and I don't know about you, but I was getting a Wayne's World vibe from some of it, even with some of the musical cues. I don't know if that was that was really hitting you, but Wayne's World is what I kept thinking of when they whenever they tried to make some of these jokes. Well, they actually did the Wayne's World reference. Did you notice that? I did, yes. Specifically, so, that's, you know, that's you know, I mean, that's the main reason why I was thinking of the Wayne, of Wayne's World, but man alive. All right, let's talk about the technical aspects of this movie. I know you really like the costume design. I think the costumes were fine. I don't think they were particularly great. 
I don't really have a whole lot to say about the technical parts of it because I don't think the score was nearly as good. The musical choices don't make any sense. The songs are good, but they don't make any sense within the context of the movie. And I know that you want to talk about Tarzan Boy. Yeah, so like, you know, when uh, Jungle Boy came out in the... LA Confidential last year for the GCW show and he came out to Tarzan boy I lost my shit because I love that song and I remembered it from this movie and I remember screaming out Ninja Turtles 3 and people looking around just not knowing what the hell I was talking about that's just me being me at a wrestling show but um, I lose my mind for this song because it's great and I my friends love it too like I have some like you know friends that love 80s music and they love this song as well and it every time Jungle Boy comes out it starts getting the crowd going so I I Right now, this song beats a lot in the current era, especially in like modern, you know, indie wrestling. So I thought that was kind of a cool connection there. But it makes no sense for this song to be in the movie at all. If you listen to the lyrics, the context of the song, it just doesn't fit. Like Tarzan, it doesn't even—it's not even in the jungle. It's in the forest in China or Japan or whatever. Um, so it's just fucking off. And they just play it for two seconds in the movie, and then they played in the credits. But this ended up being a moderately. I wouldn't say successful, but, you know, a known soundtrack just because of the Tarzan Boy song. It's just so weird how things like that happen. But, um, like I mentioned before, the costumes are not nearly up to par. And I did like the costumes for, like, the background characters and feudal Japan stuff and, like, the masks and everything. That was that was good. I give it credit for that. But, you know, the music cues are just kind of rehashes from the first one. And I heard the same, you know, the music they play in, in the first one where Splitter's, like, talking at the campfire. They kind of layer that music in the background during the dramatic scenes to kind of le- replicate that feeling. But it just obviously doesn't replicate the same feelings, even though they're using the same music. So they tried, but, you know, it was nothing original and new. And it felt like a kind of a, just a rehash. So uh, my score is a five on the technical aspects. Um, it's mainly just the Jungle Boy, or the Jungle Boy Tarzan Boy song or whatever, and that's pretty much it. And I hated the costumes of this movie a lot. All right, I'm giving this a three because I just think it was it was not very well done, and I really don't want to dwell on this movie because the thing about it is I think there are certain movies that we've talked about that are bad that I think are still worth conversing and talking about. To me, the biggest problem, the biggest crime of this movie is that there is nothing to talk about, and that affects the legacy of this movie, is that this was so so much of a nothing burger that it killed the franchise. And they talked about the franchise being dead. This became a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know if the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles could have gone on if in any way, but this movie certainly will kill it dead once and for all. And if they would have to reboot it, you know, 14 years later. We would not get another turtle movie for 14 years and i think that speaks to just how bad this was and how poorly it did at the box office and whenever we do one of these franchises and whenever there's a movie that just completely kills it i give an automatic zero and that is what i'm doing in this case um i'm gonna go with a two um the legacy is just like i said it's pretty much the tarzan boy song and people remember this as the time traveling turtles movie so that's kind of what everyone remembers it for, and you know what I mean? Like, when I gave that 7 score to uh, Secret of the Ooze, it's because it's people remember those things, and it's in the pop culture, uh, you know, world, and stuff like that, and it sticks. But nothing from this movie sticks at all, and it sucks, because there's a lot of opportunity here, and they could have done some interesting things, but they just rushed it, and, you know, it sucks, so, two. My total score is a 10. Uh, I guess it's 20 for me, twice as much as you, but that's still not saying a lot. I don't know what it says that you gave this twice, the score is doubled, and it's still really bad. The total score is a 30, by far the worst of the total scores, and this is very close to being something that would be in the pile of shame. I don't think this is as bad as a Catwoman. I think a Catwoman is historically bad. I don't think this is as bad as, as Green Lantern, but this is a movie that certainly I would put up there as being one of the worst superhero films that's ever been made, certainly within this franchise especially. Totally agree, and it's it's a shame because, like we said, there's a lot of opportunity here, and I think right off the bat when they changed the from the, the Henson Company to that new company for the costumes of the Turtles, that was like the first big major sign, and from there it was just all downhill. All right, let's get to the burning questions. How do you make this movie better? Which is a loaded question. 
I guess just take, I mean, if you really want to do the time travel stuff, you can do it, but you got to take the time to set up the rules. So this movie has to be an hour and 45 minutes, not an hour and 25, and they can't rush things, and they, they got to slow things down and not do as many jokes, because it just felt like just they're just trying to do all these jokes, and nothing st- uh, sticking, and no one knows what they're talking about or referencing uh, in feudal Japan with all these jokes, because there's no pop culture then, you know what I mean? So they're... They're only making themselves laugh. You know what I mean? So it's kind of stupid. I think the biggest issue is that nobody's taking this seriously. And as has been proven with a lot of superhero movies in the 90s and 2000s, is you sometimes get this. Is you get directors, writers, actors that are not taking it seriously. And when they don't take it seriously, the audience is not going to take it seriously either. So I think this movie needed to just be better and people needed to take it seriously in order for it to do so. Weirder hair, April or Casey? I want to say Casey, because at least April looked natural. Casey's hair looked naturally long in the first one, but this is obviously a wig in the third one, because he's playing two roles, and the second role is like a buzz cut. It's just weird, because I couldn't help but think like he slightly looks like the two different eras of CM Punk, and it's weird because I know CM Punk wanted to play Casey Jones in the new movies that came out, and he never got to play him. So I thought that was kind of weird that the sh- the... You know, the buzz cut, bearded CM Punk look, which is like circa 2012 CM Punk. And then the long hair, clean shaven kind of look, that's kind of like, what, 2005-ish. So I thought that was just kind of weird that I kept thinking of CM Punk the whole time. So I'll go with uh, Casey Jones. I don't know. April April's hair is pretty bizarre. I don't know if this is something that was like out of the 90s, but it just, it really didn't seem to fit in with her character. And just the fact that she was in this movie the way she was, I think that just makes me answer that. So it's 1993, the same year as the Mario Brothers movie. Were you disappointed Yoshi wasn't a dinosaur? Uh, no, but see, I thought they were going for the ancestor of Yoshi, uh, you know, the guy that was the owner of Splinter, right? Remember that was his name? I, that's a deep cut. I don't think this movie is smart enough to make that reference. See, that's what I was thinking. Like, it's no way. But why did they use the same name? Because I looked it up, and yeah, his name is Yoshi from the first one. So I guess, I don't know if there was just a common name, or just they wanted to use the name Yoshi because of Nintendo, and that's probably the reason why, which is stupid. But, you know, <laughs> I thought it was just kind of weird that they used that name, and I was like, did they really reference the first movie from this ancient, you know, like it's his ancestor or something, but of course not. They're not that smart. Alright, what's up with time travel in this universe? Because it doesn't make any sense, and you can literally just grab a random scepter and do some time travel. This is really dangerous, right? I'm not sure, man. Yeah, like, how did this not happen before, right? How has this only happened the first time? How did they not know the scepter was a time traveling device? And, like, did they expect that replacement scepter to work just as equally, even though it was designed by Donatello? I don't know. There's a lot of questions, man, that just make no sense. And the whole switching the clothes thing made it even weirder. Because, like I mentioned, like, is that dude wearing April's panties? We don't know. I don't... That's a real, That's a burning question I don't want to ask. Is this the worst Turtle movie ever? Spoiler alert, this is the worst one. You know... I want to say yes, but I still have never seen the sequel to the, I guess, the 2016 one, the one with Bebop and Rocksteady, so we're... One with the 20 foot, the first one came out in 2014, the second one came out in 2016. I feel confident in saying it is not great, but it is better than this. We'll see, because I left that, the one in 2014 just, like, shaking my head and being like, wow, that was a lot of unnecessary explosions and all kinds of stuff, and I remember the ending of that movie being... The last 10 minutes of that movie being more expensive than the first movie of the original trilogy. That is true. So, unfortunately, we have to take a break from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We are going to review TMNT in two weeks, because next week we are going to be doing something related to the premiere of Watchmen on Sunday, October the 20th. It is premiering on HBO as a brand new series created by Damon Lindelof, Matt Waters, and Ben Phillips. They are going to have their podcast talking about aspects of the Watchmen. What we are going to be doing here on Superhero Pantheon is reviewing the Zack Snyder 2009 film. Fittingly, it is the 10-year anniversary of that film. We are reviewing the theatrical cut, not the one that is 45 minutes longer and includes uh, the, the bonus scenes and bonus features. So we will just be reviewing the theatrical cut. I am really excited to watch the opening credits again, at least. 
Yeah, that's that's clearly the best part. And listen, man, as much as we hate on Zack Snyder, how much as you hate Zack Snyder, you can't deny how awesome the first two minutes of Watchmen are. And that's probably the heights of that movie. But uh, it, we'll talk about it next week. But or uh, when, on that episode. But just how faithful do you want to be to a comic book, and how faithful you want to be to a story, and how detrimental is that to the actual movie making process? And I guess you could say that in that case, Zack Snyder never compromised. No, he did not. And actually, will this be the last Zack Snyder movie we ever review on this podcast? We'll find out. Thankfully, it is. I am really hopeful he never does another superhero movie, because that means next week that's it for Zack Snyder. So I'm really excited for that. Right, and I was about to say, like, Sucker Punch is, is not a superhero movie, so we're not going to review that. So Even if it was... Even if it was, you need to find someone else to... I'm not watching that movie again. That is where I draw the line. I don't know if it's worse than Catwoman, but I am never, I'm never watching that movie again. Well, I never even saw it, so we're even. Probably for the best. For Brian, my name is Jerome. Thank you so much for listening to our review of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3. We will return next week for Watchmen. Oh, 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 o